Hello. Today we are going to look at an old radio. As you can tell from the background, my wall of old radios is still up. I probably ought to put them back. They they, they made a good background for a, a video or two a couple of a couple of things ago. But yeah, they're taking up space, they need to go back. Anyway, I did get some requests, a couple of requests, to talk about some of these radios. Now, normally uh, my radios are the old 1920s and 30s military sets, Army and Navy, U.S. origin. But I do like the old wood box, very kind of utilitarian-looking wireless era radios from the 20s. And, uh, yeah, my wall of radios in the back has uh, kind of some typical ones, a couple oddballs. Anyway, I figured I'm going to pull one out and talk about it. And today we are going to look at this one, a Clap Eastham Radak Model C3. Now, incidentally, this was not actually in the previous video. I was going to do the smaller Radak smaller clap Easton that I have. But when I tried opening that up, I found some wires that need disconnecting. Yeah, a pain in the neck to look at inside, put it that way. So I picked up the, uh, the C3 from another part of the wall of radios. Let's talk about it, because it represents kind of typical early, mid-30s radio technology. So anyway, clap Easton was... A bit of a little, a little bit of a legendary name in the uh, old wireless era. It, the the company dates way, way back to kind of the prehistory of radios. 1906. Originally, it was Clap, Eddie, and Eastham. Uh, basically, three engineers. I think it was actually a couple engineers and the sales guy, because you always need the sales guy, don't you? that saw this upcoming boom in, well, radio technology. And keep in mind, vacuum tubes weren't really a thing yet. So people were playing with coherers and spark sets and things like that. Anyway, these three guys split off from the company that they were working at at the time and decided to make their own company. Clap, Eddie, and Easton. Well, they started in the parts business, and uh, they actually were primarily a, a place where experimenters could buy parts, and they, they both made the parts and also were a distributor for other people's uh, assembled parts. Then they started to get into actually making more complex assemblies and eventually radios, and that's when they hit it big. They were at the right place, right time for the big radio boom a little after World War I ended. So, unfortunately for the Clap Easton, Easton Company, company uh, and you'll notice, yeah, there's a name missing there. That's because the original three, well, they started leaving the company. One by one, they left the company. And uh, it wasn't too long before... <laughs> None of the three founders were related with the company anymore, but the name Clas Clap Eastham stayed around. Uh, Eastham, of course, probably the most famous of the bunch because he went on to found a very famous legendary name, General Radio. This was back in 1915. And General Radio, they were the thing for a very long time, very high quality test equipment, probably only surpassed by HP after World War II as far as general quality of, of test equipment. General Radio is a little bit of another sad story, which maybe I'll get around to eventually. So, yeah, Clap Eastman, Eastman the company, stuck around, and uh, they were generally regarded as fairly good sets, bit of overpriced. This particular one here, the C3, apparently was $100 when it came out in 1923. That was a lot of money. Uh, 
Uh, however, the company didn't play its cards right and did not even make it to the Great Depression. By 1926, they were really in trouble. Uh, they, they had a lot of competition, of course, and, well, for instance, Crosley, and uh, there are Crosleys in the back. If I uh, <laughs> move this guy out of the way, you can see that bottom row is a couple of Crosleys. Crosley essentially crushed them, <laughs> and an awful lot of other people, too. I'll get to the Crosleys in a, in a later video. But this radio here was kind of a mid to upper line radio from Clap Eastham. And uh, their kind of brand name was Radak. They applied that to some, kind of a bunch of their older radio, or later radios, I should probably say. And uh, from 1923. And uh, yeah, let's take a look inside. Uh, it is a pretty typical regenerative set of the uh, mid-twenties. Okay, well, see a bunch of knobs and a nice uh, black panel. And, uh, well, let's just go over it. A regenerative set is an exceedingly simple radio. Essentially, you have an oscillator. Uh, an RF oscillator, and this, of course, works on the standard AM broadcast band that's been around forever. You have an oscillator that's you stick right at the verge of oscillation, and you can, of course, tune the oscillator, but you also uh, apply feedback, and the idea is you put just enough feedback in that it doesn't quite break into oscillation. And the idea being is the radio signal that's tuned in coming through the antenna is kind of just enough to get that to start oscillating. But of course it doesn't really oscillate it because you don't want to, well, just have this thing run away on you. So you have to kind of do this, this balancing act with the regeneration and uh, have this oscillator almost working tuned into a signal, and, well, then what you get out is you detect it, you get audio out. It's AM. It's very easy to, to detect. And uh, this was a, an exceedingly common way to make a radio receiver back then. And a uh, nice advantage to it is you can make these, th if you're a skilled operator, you could get these things to be extremely sensitive. Now, they weren't very selective, but uh, you could, you, if you knew how to ride the regeneration control, you could, you could pick up things that just out of nothing, pick up signals out of nothing. So let's look at this. Well, the first two knobs here are for basically their capacitors, and we'll, we'll show you the inside here, but nice, nice vernier reduction drives there. And this is basically for setting up the, uh, the, the frequency of the oscillator. Now down here is a tapped switch. This is for tapping the, uh, uh, some of the places in the inductor. And of course, because the oscillator is uh, a tank circuit with the, of course, the inductor and capacitors and all that kind of good stuff. The regenerate, uh, regeneration control down here, this is what you have to ride to get it to uh, just be at the verge of oscillation. Over here, we have three rheostats. And those are just for setting the filaments of the three tubes. There are three tubes in this. With a regenerative set, you really only need one tube, but this does have a couple more stages that are just purely for, for amplification. Down here, we have places for headphones. You could tap in right at the detector or at either of the the uh, uh, basically audio stages. Got a nice wood case here. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I like the radio's utilitarian. In fact, even this, this little little bit of decoration here and here, you know, I'd rather it just be a box. But hey, I'll, ta I'll take a little bit here. Anyway, let's, let's open this guy up. On almost all these sets, there's a lid. Why? Because you had to change the tubes and do things like that. So, 
let's take this out. Yes, I did take the screws out already. And pardon me while I move this around. Oh, and you can see a nice tag there. Weirdly cut off, though. I don't know what that's about. This is where your uh, cables come in for the battery, because, of course, these are battery sets, the antenna and the ground. But, yeah, nice wood box. Let's get it out of here. And go back to the radio. So, there we have the radio. But let's turn it around. Here we go. You can pretty much see what's going on here. The parts are so big compared to what we today use with you know, the tiny surface mount. Here, you know, you can see the tubes. There they are. You can see everything. They, did, they didn't use wires. They used these big bus bars here. They bolted the things together. You know, I'm going to get out my pointer. Let's take a look at this. Here are the two capacitors. This is coming right off the antenna, and uh, here is the inductor, and here is the main tuning capacitor here. And uh, if you can see, this is actually something called a, a vario coupler. And turning the regeneration knob actually moves this coil here. This is the feedback loop. And yes, you know, because of, well, inductance and, and uh, electric field or magnetic field or whatever, yes, the, the angle at which the two coils are arranged kind of relates to how much, uh, how much uh, there's like a bucking or boosting effect. So yes, when you're, when you're riding the control to do the, your regeneration, yes, you have to get it just the right spot. Now... Let's see, what else? Here are the tubes. Oh, the binding posts, and of course you can see where it's labeled, what goes where. The tubes are O1As. Now here we have kind of your standard UX201As. You know, let's not use those. Get out, get out, get out. The UX201As are kind of a little late for this set. So we're going to put in nice tubes. We're going to use the kind of period appropriate one. Look at this. This is a nice peach, isn't it? It's called a peach because these uh, UV200s, some of them have this a little bit of a pink yellow hue to them. And uh, that was due to them, uh, I think, the gettering and also the fact that they're a little soft on purpose. They're a little gassy on purpose. And then we'll put in a couple of O1s. These are 201s, not 201A. So yes, they draw 5 volts at a full amp each. Oh, isn't that so much better? Now, you may be wondering, what are these for? These holes. Well, they're for watching the tubes. <laughs> Literally, they are for watching the tubes. Because with these rheostats, what you need to do is adjust the filament... And, for one, you wanted to make sure the, the filaments were okay and the tube didn't burn out. But also, you kind of looked at the color of the filament and uh, well, made sure it wasn't shining too bright or too dim. So now that we have some nice period-appropriate tubes in there, let's take a look at the bottom. Nice and gentle. You can see uh, that bus bar construction here have a couple of audio transformers and unfortunately with this set it's a bit dead right now because the transformers have gone open and that is an extremely common problem with 1920s audio transformers it's very hard to find ones that have not gone open and it's mostly a corrosion issue these things are what closing in on 100 years old you know 90 to 100 years old and uh yeah the 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 I don't know if it was the flux and the solder or what, but so many of them, the wires break, often right at the joint. So, yeah, we've got a couple of the audio transformers here, some of the bus bars, and you can see, yep, this is, this is where you uh, can plug in your, uh, your headphones right then, and, right then and there. So, yeah, very, very nicely made set. Uh, Clap Eastums were not junk. They were 
pretty decent. They were no means the high end, uh, but they were good radios. They were expensive, though. And, well, that may be one of the things that killed them in the end. They just, they just couldn't afford to fight with the uh, much cheaper Crosleys. Or the uh, the uh, Westinghouse. Well, you can't see the RC, but there's an RC up there. Um, uh, they just couldn't compete. And the original founders had gone gone on to much better things, especially Melville Eastham, General Radio. What a success! Uh, but Class Clap Eastham just kind of faded away, and by the late twenties, they were gone. Didn't even make it to the Depression. All right. Let's bring this thing back. Sorry, I can't operate it until I get some new transformers. I'll be on the lookout for them. And yeah, they've got that weird round core. And uh, yeah, I'd like to get this thing uh, up and running. You know, yeah, I'll be honest, it's a little low on the list because uh, it is just a, an AM radio. There's nothing I really want to listen to anyway. Um, and I've got 8 million other projects, probably 9 million by now. Uh, but yeah, neat set. I do like these these 20s utilitarian black box sets. I love them. And the thing is, I, I now when I was younger, when I was a kid, these things were so expensive. Unfortunately, now the the market has really really kind of collapsed on them. So I can afford these things. You know, this uh, these uh, sets I got in the back, I got them relatively cheaply priced. You know, at one time, this was probably several hundred dollars, six hundred dollars or something like that. You don't have to worry about that anymore. They're, they're the, the market's just really gotten clobbered. All right. Well, I hope you like this video. I'll be doing some of the other radios in the background. In fact, let's uh, maybe uh, show them off a little bit. And uh, any requests? Come on. My tripod work. Uh, there we go. But yeah, I'll probably pull out a few more of these if you have any requests. Let me know. And uh, yeah, we'll kind of do another look at these things. Okay, if you like the video, leave a like, leave a comment, share it around. Catch me on uh, Twitter. Uniservo is the handle. And uh, yeah, talk to you later. Bye now.